Well, hello, Life Group leaders, and I want to welcome you to our fourth training. It's We're moving along. And again, I want to uh, be sure and emphasize that some of the stuff I'm saying is probably redundant because you guys are such amazing leaders. But um, it's good to be reminded, and we got to keep the foundation the same in all of our groups that I'm, I'm really kind of going over some values of what it really is supposed to look like in being a leader in our life groups here at Canyon View. So one thing I have to admit, I have seen over the years, we've been doing our life groups now probably six years, the people that really actually get involved and engaged in life groups, man, I see them growing. Um, I see them growing spiritually. I see them growing relationally. Even marriages uh, becoming deeper and more loving. And, and I've seen them grow in, uh, in their serving within the church. It's th there's just so many benefits that people have. And the reality is, I, I know this. This is human nature. This is me. If I don't see any benefit in something, I'm just going to lose interest. I'm not going to really put much time and energy into it because I've got too many things to do. So, uh, for instance, I have uh, worked out all my life, ever since high school. I just had a lifestyle that I love working out. And I'm not like crazy gonzo kind of thing, but uh, like I've run marathons, I've ridden my bike across the country, and I've been able to do all that kind of stuff because I, I like to work out. And the reason is, is I feel better. And some of the people have asked me, like, how do you survive as a pastor? And how do you deal with the stress? And the reality is, one of the things that is so important for me is regular exercise. It's a great stress reliever for me. So uh, we belong to health clubs all our whole married life, Jane and I. And she started at Mesa Fitness this thing called NLP. It's called Next Level Performance, and it's, it's kind of like a CrossFit class. And she started going, and she started telling me how, what, what a great workout it was. And she kept saying, you ought to come with me. And I'd go, nah, 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 nah. I've got my own thing. And, I mean, I had my own, like, patterns of how I worked out. I've been doing it for years. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of a thing. But the reality is, I was really more intimidated because <laughs> I'd see those guys working out in there and I go, dang, those guys are working hard. But she finally convinced me to go. So I went and it was like unbelievable. It was killing me. And uh, the teacher that was teaching the class, I saw him like a week later and he goes, well, how'd you do? And I said, dude, I couldn't walk for three days. <laughs> and he said, you're welcome. <laughs> no empathy from Mark, the teacher. But it's such a high-intensity workout, and they have you working muscles that I forgot were there. <laughs> and, um, and, but I quickly started to realize that I was really getting strong in a lot of areas of my body that I, I really probably wasn't focusing on in my own personal workouts. And uh, so I was seeing benefit in it. it within a couple of weeks, I was feeling stronger. And so I'm motivated to keep going. And my statement that I, I like to joke in class is we're all sucking air. I said, why do we pay money to do this? <laughs> But it's because of the benefit. I'm, I'm uh, managing my weight, and I'm feeling stronger, and uh, especially stronger in areas that um, I think need it to be made stronger, especially my core. So the reason I say that is that's what people need to experience in our life groups, is they're taking their personal time. They're taking time away from their family. They're, they're taking time away from things around the house and a lot of other things they could be doing with their time. But they have to see benefit. And so what are these benefits? 
what, one of the things that I see, the first thing, is it encourages us to live a biblical lifestyle. And this happens by the group coming together and exploring God's truth together. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to us through one another. And that's why we love having uh, discussion in our life groups is inevitably we all learn from one another because that's what the Holy Spirit wants. And uh, 1 John 1, verses 2 and 3. He said, the life was made manifest, that would be Jesus, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John is talking about the amazing power that we have of influencing one another by sharing our testimonies of what God is teaching us. Just last week, one of the women in our group, she shared something that God had really revealed to her in the topic of fasting. And it was something that I never really considered before. And it was like a wow moment for me, like, wow, that is really profound. And I, I thanked her profusely for what she shared. And I know it made an impact on others in our group. And so what inevitably happens as we share what God is teaching us, it just kind of builds in some accountability there uh, because we're kind of like encouraging each other, let's walk this out. And if, if I see a, a brother um, really going off the rails, I'm going to get with, together with them and say, hey, dude, what are you doing? And that accountability helps us and encourages us to strengthen one another so that we can do the most difficult thing, which is to how to live outside of the, or how to live apart from the world, but live a biblical life in the world so that we have impact. So I want to do this. Uh, we've been doing this, but stop the recording and discuss among yourselves this question. How has your life personally been transformed by exploring God's Word together in your life group. So stop the recording and spend some time discussing. All right, well, welcome back. I hope you guys had great discussion together. So I want to talk about the second thing that I see, the second benefit, is this encourages us to live a missional life. So I talked about biblical life, now I'm talking about a missional life. Now, um, I was kind of chuckling when I was talking to Chrissy, my, my son Joey's wife, and they lead a, a life group of young adults, and they got an amazing group going. And Chrissy told us that four couples in their group are expecting little kiddos right now. Four <laughs> couples have a baby in the hopper. <laughs> so... Uh, I told her, well, that's an example of how life begets life. And, you know, we've, we've seen this cycle of life for centuries. And uh, so what, what I'm talking about is I, I told our staff this on, on Thursday. When I was a young Christian, I only had been a Christian a year. I distinctly remember this moment. I was driving with a couple of friends, and we're driving up Dartmouth Street in Boulder to go to my friend Wayne Johnson's house because we were going to have a little get-together. And I said to them, I have just realized if I can be as far away as from God as I was and for God to use something like Young Life to help me to find Jesus, I want to commit my life to do the same thing. I want to help others who don't know Jesus and far away from God to find him. And that was like a, a seminal moment in my life 
that what I was really uh, communicating, I didn't understand it then, but that's when I was responding to the call of God in my life. And um, so Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 3.15. He said, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And so if, as life group leaders, this, I think, in, uh, in especially with people that have been walking with Jesus a long time, it's really difficult to get Christians to actually live missionally because we get so comfortable of just hanging out with Christians. And everything we do is with Christians. And so as a life group leader, we have to create a missional culture in our life group. And so, first of all, it just takes encouragement. we got to continually be casting that vision that we are a missional life group and we have a heart for the lost and we want to create opportunities for us to develop relationships with people outside of the church so that they can come and find Jesus. And uh, one of the things that we do uh, need to do, and I know you guys are great at this, is creating a welcoming, uh, a open, and a loving atmosphere in your group. So if someone new comes in, people just, you know, get up and they introduce themselves and they welcome them and they laugh with them and they engage with them. We have to create that environment. The worst thing you want is for someone new to walk in the door and everyone's talking amongst one another and they ignore the new person. That is not creating an open environment. And uh, the, the other thing we have to do is we have to model to our group. We can't just say, hey, we're supposed to live missionally, but we don't. So I really encourage people in your day-to-day -day life, at work, and even in your recreational pursuits in your neighborhood, you're living missionally. And so, as most of you know, I love to play golf. And one of the reasons I love to play golf is because I always gather three other guys and we just hang out and we joke with each other and we jab at each other and we laugh at each other a lot. But I always try to think of who are some of my unchurched friends that I can invite to play with us. And so it's, it's really fun that if I have two, two other Christian believers and I invite an unchurched friend in with the group, that friend is, he doesn't understand this, but he's being loved on by this group. And uh, he's seeing people living uh, a life in Jesus and enjoying something like golf together, but it, it is moving people closer to start looking at Jesus. What do you do? What do you love to do? Camping, fishing, uh, knitting, making quilts. I don't know what you love to do, but how can you use that to live a missional life? So uh, the other thing that we want to start doing with our groups, this would be awesome, is for each group to identify a, a missions group that they as a group want to support and encourage and pray for. So uh, for instance, maybe your group would partner with Young Life. And when Young Life has uh, a banquet or Young Life has um, a fundraising event, that your group just gets involved and helps. Um, maybe your group wants to partner with us with Petros Network. And your group would pool resources together and actually, your group would plant one church planter and, uh, and continue to pray for that church planter. That could be an uh, awesome opportunity for your group to really be missionally focused. It may, it may be something local like the Pregnancy Center, uh, Four Winds Coffee Shop, the Homeless Shelter. Man, there's just multiple things that 
your group can partner together to make an impact, either here or abroad. So consider that. So now we're going to go into our next thing of discussion. And I want you to talk among each other ways that you have intentionally helped your group to, to uh, be missional are some ideas of what you want to do in the future to be missional. So let's turn off the re uh, this thing <laughs> and, and do your discussion. Go ahead. All right, well, welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful discussion with that. And so I'm going into the third benefit of life groups. And this is really important, is it encourages us to give pastoral care. Now, uh, I, I can say this with all sincerity. It has been an unbelievable privilege to be uh, the pastor or to be a senior pastor for the past 24 years. And uh, I have seen lives change dramatically, whole families changed, and generations uh, of God moving in their lives. It's a great privilege to, to be a part of that. But the reality is, and you guys all know this, that it's impossible for, for me to give pastoral care to everyone in a church of this size, of Canyon View. And uh, I kind of chuckle when I think of Moses. <laughs> Moses was really a pastor of like two million people. <laughs> they're they're uh, a traveling church, and they're in the desert, and Moses would sit in his chair, and everyone would bring their beefs to him, and he would have to kind of judge uh, what is the wisest thing and how to resolve issues and conflicts. I mean, I can't imagine the conflicts that these people had. And it's interesting that his father-in-law, Jethro, came out to the desert because he wanted to see what was happening. This was quite an event, as you can imagine. And so he saw what was going on. And he came to the conclusion, Moses, you are crazy. You're going to kill yourself. Look at all these people lined up. You cannot judge and lead all these people through all of their controversies. And so he gave them this advice in Matthew 18. He said, I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws. So he says you got to teach them the the laws that God gave him. And then he says, and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. So that's kind of what a pastor does from the pulpit, is this very thing. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, men who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter that they shall bring to you, but any small matter, they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people will go to their place of peace. Man, what great wisdom from Jethro. That's exactly what I've seen and witnessed happening with you guys being able to pastor the people in your life groups. You know, there is nothing that brings me greater joy well, I could say a whole one would bring me great joy, but there's nothing that brings me greater joy than hearing stories of someone in a life group having a family member die. And that life group just surrounding, circling the wagons around this person and bringing pastoral care, and I don't get called. 
because that person or that family is seeing how the church is being the church to them and bringing that pastoral support to them and their family. That is awesome. That's the one of the greatest values of people being in community is that's where they find that support. And so there may be some big things that go on that people need actual to talk to a pastor, but I if someone comes and talks to me about an issue, I always ask them, are you in a life group? And a lot of times they say no. And so that gives me an opportunity to say, well, here are some of the benefits of why I think you should be in a life group, and I help to direct them to it. So there are so many practical ways that life groups help each other. They help each other move. Uh, they make meals for someone when someone's sick. The Someone may, may be an expert on cars or plumbing or electricity, and and they they just step in and help one another. This is bringing pastoral support and care, care to your group. So you're going to stop the camera again, and uh, I guess it would be a projector or TV. <laughs> but discuss together how you have seen your group give pastoral care to each other and what you can do to enhance this in your group to be even more pastoral. So take some time to discuss that. All right. Well, welcome back. I know you guys are having engaging conversations and uh, enjoying and having joy uh, in being together. So I want to go over the fourth and the last thing. And this is, uh, this is really critical for life groups that have a lot of life in it is we got to uh, be encouraging leadership development in our groups. As healthy life groups grow, because like I said, life begets life. And if you have a loving, dynamic, joyful, and faith-filled group, I think it's just naturally going to grow because people start saying, you should come to our life group because you can't believe how wonderful these people are and the, the blessing that it is to be a part of this. So um, what Jane and I have done over the last six years that we've been life group leaders is we pray, Holy Spirit, reveal to us who the next leaders are. We're always doing that from the first group we have, the first day we started praying that. And so I think of Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Okay, so God gives different grace to different people with different gifts and abilities, and he explains this. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes or gives in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, as, as you heard those different gifts, you may have automatically been thinking of people in your life group that have these different gifts. And you see these gifts operate more prevalently in people that uh, just kind of naturally operate in those giftings. And um, the point I'm making is leadership, uh, and this may be controversial to some of you, but not everyone can lead. We have to have the gift of leadership that the Holy Spirit gives us. For instance, Corey Sandro, he has a very high level gift of leadership. I'm learning from him about how to be a better leader. And I believe it's a gift and an anointing from the Holy Spirit that God's given to Corey. So 
what I've learned over the years, and we've made some mistakes in this, I got to admit, is we can't try to force a gift on a person that doesn't have that gift. I mean, it just blows up in our face. It really does. But here's the deal. You may have someone in your group or a few people in your group. They really want to be a leader. It's like, uh, it's kind of like, well, if I'm in a life group, I'm supposed to become a leader. But if they don't have the gift, it's going to be really problematic. I've seen this. But what do we do about that then? We ask the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and discernment. What is this person's gift? Now, you, you just appreciate they're faithful. Man, they're there every week. Uh, they're available. When you ask, will you lead this? They say, yes, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and they're, they're teachable. They want to learn and they want to grow. That's wonderful. But if they don't have, if you don't see the gift of leadership on them, it's really difficult to put them in leadership positions because what inevitably happens, um, they get frustrated because they're operating out of their gift. So what do we do with a person like this? But for instance, what if this person is an incredible servant? They're there early. They're helping arrange the chairs. After everyone leaves, they're helping you clean up. That person has a gift of servanthood. And so put them with a leader. A leader needs people like that. And make a team. And that's what we've seen is uh, a lot of times a team works better than just having one person or a couple be the sole leader um, because there's encouragement and there's support and there's giftings that they bring in. Uh, one new leader that we have that we're working with, his wife's an administrator. And so they're a great team together. Uh, man, my life would be a debacle <laughs> if I didn't have Jane in my life with her administrative and uh, financial gifting. Dang, I'd be living in a van <laughs> by the river. <laughs> so uh, it's the giftings that we, we bless and we honor. So take some time now and talk about what you've seen in others that has helped you to identify leadership in them. What are, what are some of the characteristics and some of the things they do and say? And uh, then spend some time praying for those emerging leaders that you have in your group. Well, welcome back. And uh, I hope this is challenging you, uh, this, uh, this training as we talk about this. And in closing, as you can see, as a leader of your life group, or if you are being trained to become a leader of a life group, there's a lot of things to consider. And there's a lot happening when your group gets together, and even when you're not together, as you're praying for your group, is that your group, your group's growth and development and even multiplication, it doesn't happen vicariously. It takes good leadership. And it's very important that if you are, have a team leader or if you are a leader with a spouse, take some time to kind of do an audit of your group. How are we doing in these areas? And then look at what are some things we can do to enhance uh, some of these areas in our group, to help people to live a more biblical lifestyle and how can we be more missional and encourage that in our group? What kind of things can we do to give more pastoral care to those in need? I just, uh, as I've been talking, I, I just got a little pop-up that a gentleman in our church just passed away at 10 o'clock today. And uh, Hey, gang. Uh, as you can see, I don't have my hat on, but I got the same shirt. And this is actually a couple weeks after we did this original training. And uh, we had some technical difficulties, so I'm redoing the ending. And uh, in the end of that uh, last training, I got a text during it that our friend Tom Vaughn had gone home to Jesus. And 
Susie and Tom have been in this church for probably 20 years. Susie is just a dear, dear sister in the Lord. So I saw her at church on Sunday. I went up, gave her a hug, and I said, Susie, how are you doing? And she said, you know, I'm doing really good. And she said, it's because of my group, my life group. We've been together for years, and they just have surrounded me with love, with support, encouragement, even going out to do some fun things together. And she says, I know I'm not alone, and I'm doing fine. And uh, isn't that a great picture of how life groups can bring pastoral support to our members when they're in their greatest crisis and their greatest need? That's life together. And so keep doing it, guys. What you're doing is so vital to the wealth and the well or the health and the well-being of our people. And you guys are front line of bringing that pastoral support. So I bless you, I thank you, and I honor you. And uh, let's keep doing it for the glory of, of our Lord. Love you guys.